Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. My name is Mark Thiessen. I'm a scholar here at AEI. In just over a week, Congress will vote on a resolution of disapproval for the nuclear deal that President Obama negotiated with Iran. President Obama says that the vote is a choice between war and peace, and that there is no alternative to this deal, and those who oppose it are making common cause with the hardliners in Iran. That group in league with the Ayatollah Khamenei includes the Senate Democratic leader, Chuck Schumer, the former Democratic chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Bob Menendez, the current Democratic chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, Ben Cardin, and it includes our speaker tonight, uh, today, uh, Vice President Dick Cheney. Uh, Vice President Cheney is the author with his, with his daughter Liz of a wonderful new book called Exceptional, Why the World Needs a Powerful America. In it, he suggests that President Obama has few diplomatic accomplishments, but there is one accomplishment that he has he is not only, with this, this Iran deal is so bad that he's not only united Arabs and Israelis, he's ignited Chuck Schumer and Dick Cheney. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President. Well, thank you very much, Mark. I, uh, I hadn't thought of that. It's probably the first time Chuck Schumer and I agreed on anything, but uh, he's, uh, he's welcome to the club. Well, I'm... Uh, Delighted to be here today. AEI has been uh, a home of sorts, a second home of us for a long time, going back to the Ford administration. I'm proud to serve on the Board of Trustees now, and on occasion, um, they provide a forum where we can discuss important issues. Uh, I come before you today not as a candidate for any office. My years in uh, elective office are over. I come before you as a citizen who's also spent the better part of 40 years in public service. It's White House Chief of Staff, Congressman, Secretary of Defense, and Vice President. Focus much of that time on national security issues facing our nation. I'm here because I have deep concerns about the Iranian nuclear agreement that Congress begins considering today. It will be up to members of the House and Senate to vote yes or no on the joint comprehensive plan of action that President Obama has signed with the government of Iran. For every member of Congress, no matter how many years they serve or how many votes they cast, this is a vote that will be remembered. So much is in the balance for our own security and that of our allies. It's not a moment for appeals to party loyalty, for whip calls or returning favors or lining up against the president for its own sake or lining up with the president for its own sake. Every man and woman in Congress will have to stand alone on this issue. And they should choose with nothing else in mind but the merits of the case and the interest of our country, bringing their own best judgment to a decision that theirs alone is, is, that is theirs alone to make. I've come in that spirit today, setting aside for now any broader disagreements with the Obama administration, any stake in past debates, any concern of electoral politics this vote in Congress will have profound consequences. Approval of this agreement will not prevent a nuclear Iran. Along with a pathway to a nuclear arsenal, President Obama's agreement will provide Iran with funds and weapons the regime will use for the support of terror, the dominance of the Middle East, and the furtherance of Tehran's effort to destroy Israel, threaten Arab regimes, and prevent the United States from defending our allies and our interest in the Persian Gulf and beyond. With the removal of restrictions on Iran's ballistic missile program, this agreement will give Iran the means to launch a nuclear attack on the U.S. homeland. A week before the deal was announced, President Obama's own Secretary of Defense, Alston Carter, declared this should not happen. Quote, the I in ICBM, Ashton Carter noted, stands for intercontinental, which means having the capability to fly from Iran to the United States, and we don't want that. That was a week before he knew what was in the agreement. I know of no nation in history that has agreed to guarantee that the means of its own destruction will be in the hands of another nation, particularly one that is hostile. What President Obama is asking the United States Congress to do is unique, historically and dangerously unique. The results could well be catastrophic. The claims made by President Obama, Secretary Kerry, and other members of the Obama administration about this agreement have been robust. 
This deal will, they have said, and I quote, prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, cut off all Iran's pathways to a bomb, including the covert pathway, provide us with a certainty we will know what they are doing in the nuclear arena, prevent nuclear proliferation, encourage stability across the Middle East, and prevent war. These assertions are simply false. Take the President's assurance that the agreement will prevent Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. In a more candid moment a few months ago, he admitted that under his, this deal, the Iranians in 13 years or so will have, and I quote, advanced centrifuges that enrich uranium fairly rapidly, and at that point, the breakout times would have shrunk to zero. The President's own words make clear that this agreement does not keep Iran from nuclear capability. Quite the opposite, it guarantees that in less time than has passed since 9-11, a regime with death to America as a pillar of its national policy will have the ability and the material to produce an arsenal of nuclear weapons. And at that point, what is to prevent them from doing so? Well, President Obama tells us they promise they won't. We are asked to rely on the word of a country that has cheated on every nuclear agreement to which they have been a party, that once they have the means in place to become a nuclear power, they won't do it. President Obama came into office determined to engage the Iranians without preconditions, beginning with his inaugural address, offering them an open hand if they unclenched their fist. Through his letters to the Iranian Supreme Leader, through the secret negotiations established by Secretary Clinton with the Iranians in Oman in 2011, President Obama's guiding principle has been convincing the Iranians they can trust us. If we walk away from this deal, Secretary Kerry recently claimed, the regime in Tehran will learn, quote, you can't trust the West. A negotiation based on the premise that the United States had to gain the trust of the world's worst state sponsor of terror was never going to end well. The secret talks before the actual negotiations even began, the U.S. side appears to have made three key concessions. They agreed to drop the long-standing demand of the international community that Iran halt uranium enrichment. They agreed to provide immediate sanctions relief, and they agreed to pay the Iranians to negotiate by releasing 12 billion in frozen assets. These were just the concessions made prior to the negotiations. So much for negotiations without preconditions. There were, in fact, preconditions. They just weren't ours. The Iranians are reputed to be excellent negotiators, and for the American side, that is not an auspicious beginning. It set the pattern of one concession to Iran after another. Hard deadlines declared and then ignored. A general air of desperation to get a deal, not on their part, but on ours, and not on our terms, but on theirs. The cave on, cave on enrichment wasn't just any concession. Under the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, signed by some 120 nations, 190 nations, including Iran, countries with peaceful nuclear programs do not have a right to enrich agreeing to the demand that the United States recognize such a right for Iran guts the fundamental principle at the heart of the NPT and makes it much more difficult for the international community to deny such a right to any other state. It also in one fell swoop neutered six United Nations Security Council resolutions passed to stop Iran's nuclear program, including its uranium enrichment activities. President Obama, who says he is committed to the international arms control regime, to the United Nations, and to nuclear nonproliferation, is now urging that the United States accept an agreement that will undercut the most effective multilateral arms control treaty in history and negate the previous demands of the international community expressed in those UN Security Council resolutions. The President says this deal will, quote, stop the spread of nuclear weapons in this region. In fact, by legitimizing the Iranian enrichment program for the first time ever, 
The deal will likely accelerate nuclear proliferation as other nations demand the same right. America's friends and allies in the Middle East, including the Gulf states, know that their own security hangs in the balance as the United States enables Iran to acquire nuclear weapons. They have watched the Iranians get the better of us in these negotiations. simultaneously withdrawing from the region and making cuts to our own nuclear arsenal and defense budget. They are already assessing that the security guarantees long provided by the United States are increasingly meaningless and that announced red lines are more likely to be abandoned than defended by the United States today. They are more likely in this environment and in the aftermath of this deal to determine that their own security requires that they possess their own nuclear weapons. The President says this deal will ensure the international community will be able to verify that Iran will not develop a nuclear weapon. He has said the inspections regime is historic, that the agreement cuts off every one of Iran's pathways to a bomb, including, magically, the covert pathway. Let's look at the facts. After we were assured repeatedly by members of his administration that this agreement would include any time, anywhere inspections, President Obama has accepted a deal that gives the Iranians anywhere from 24 days to many months to delay inspections at suspicious sites. Inspections at military sites like Parchin, where the Iranians have concealed suspect elements of their nuclear weapons program in the past, are not covered by this agreement. The American people have been told not to concern themselves with this. There are secret side agreements between Iran and the IAEA, which our elected representatives in Congress cannot see either, that reportedly cover inspections at these sites. It's not clear any Obama administration officials have seen the final text of these side deals either. The Iranians continue to insist, and I quote, there will be no access to any military sites, and in at least some crucial cases relating to past activities, the regime will be inspecting itself. That is historic, historically misguided. The value of this agreement and the veracity of the President's claims about it rest on the inspections regime contained within it. Inspectors need to know what Iran has done in the past so they have a baseline against which to assess whether the country is cheating in the future. Secretary Kerry seemed to understand this in April of 2015 when he said the Iranians would have to disclose past activity. Quote, they have to do it, he said. It will be done. If there's going to be a deal, it will be done. That was John Kerry in April. Two months later, in July of this year, Secretary's position, Secretary Kerry's position, changed dramatically. Quote, we're not fixated on Iran specifically accounting for what they did at one time or another, he said, because, and I quote, we have absolute knowledge with respect to Iran's past activities. If you're looking for a quick summary of Secretary Kerry's position on the need for Iran to completely disclose all its past nuclear activity, you could say he was for it before he was against it. <laughs> General Mike Hayden, former director of the CIA and the NSA, said he knows of no American intelligence official who would claim, as Secretary Kerry does, that we have complete knowledge of what Iran has done in the past. 
detecting elements of a country's nuclear program and predicting how close it is to breakout is a notoriously difficult intelligence task. It is one that we have failed at time and time again. The United States failed to predict the first Soviet atomic test in 1949, the first Chinese test in 1964, the first Indian test in 1974, the first Pakistani test in 1998, and the first North Korean test in 2006. All of this should raise serious concerns about the claims President Obama has made that the agreement guarantees a breakout time of at least one year. Accurately assessing how far the Iranians are from obtaining a nuclear weapon would require a full and complete disclosure of their past activity. Inspectors need a baseline. If we don't know how much progress Iran has made towards obtaining a nuclear weapon, we cannot accurately assess how much farther they need to go or how long it will take them. The Iranians were unwilling to make such a disclosure, which tells us something in and of itself. And President Obama and Secretary Kerry dropped this essential requirement. Under President Obama's agreement, there will be no anywhere, anytime inspections and no inspections of military sites. Those are covered in the secret deals that we cannot see. There will be no access to the regime's nuclear scientists, no full disclosure of past activity, no full access to documents pertaining to Iran's nuclear program, and Iran will be doing some of the inspections themselves. We are essentially leaving it up to Iran to let us know when and where they might have engaged in illicit nuclear weapons activity. The President also expressed firm resolve on the matter of sanctions. They would be lifted when and only when the Iranians had first met their obligations. It worked out a little differently, of course. They got that $12 billion and other sanctions relief right away. Soon the regime will be a player again in the oil and the financial markets. And finally, something on the order of $150 billion will be coming their way in the assets released under this deal. We were told and are still being told that at the first sign of cheating, sanctions will suddenly snap back on the regime. In reality, the deal makes it very difficult to reimpose sanctions or to impose new ones. It enables Iran to walk away from the agreement completely if any attempt is made to sanction them anew. Discoveries of violations by the Iranians would be followed by long international debates over every last technical point. And who doubts what the refrain would be from the Obama administration when confronted with obvious violations? We would hear that it's better to overlook the offense than to risk losing the agreement. And that's how we came to this point in the first place. It's the same weak, acquiescent, and ultimately dangerous mindset that led us so far down the wrong road to a deal so completely tailored to the demands of the Iranians. President Obama has agreed to Iranian demands to remove restrictions on key elements of the infrastructure Tehran uses to support global terrorism, including the IRGC Quds Force. He agreed to lift restrictions on Iran's ICBM program and on its ability to impose and export, to import and export conventional weapons. In this agreement, if it's approved, these concessions will further Iran's efforts to achieve one of its main objectives in the Middle East, to drive the United States out. Former Under Secretary of Defense Ambassador Eric Edelman recently testified that under the JCPOA, quote, the United States will not be able to rely as it has for the past 30 years on an assumption that it will have unimpeded access and control in all the domains of warfare in the Persian Gulf. A recent study co-chaired by former Marine Commandant General James Conway, former Deputy Commander of the United States European Command General Charles Wald, put it this way. The JCPOA will enable Iran to improve its unconventional military capabilities to challenge the strategic position of the United States and its allies in the Middle East. Iran will be able to revitalize its defense industrial base in the short term, even if it devotes only a fraction of the 100 billion or more that will be unfrozen as part of the agreement. 
more than the government's entire budget, the Iranian government's entire budget for the current fiscal year on military spending. Over the medium term, the removal of economic sanctions and the United Nations arms embargo will allow the regime to acquire other advanced technologies and weapons from abroad. And once sanctions against its ballistic missile program sunset, Iran could more easily develop weapons capable of reaching targets in the Middle East and beyond, including Europe and the United States. It's the end of quote. This agreement will enable Iran to modernize and expand its military capabilities while the United States military suffers from the devastating Obama-era defense cuts and the effects of sequestration. <laughs> Contrary to claims made by the President and Secretary of State, the United States will be in a far worse position to defend our interest and prevent a nuclear-armed Iran when the Obama agreement sunsets than we are today. In addition to facilitating Iranian access to advanced weapons, aiding the development of its ICBM program, providing a cash windfall and tremendous economic benefits to the regime in Tehran, the Obama-Iran agreement lifts sanctions on the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC Quds Force, and the Quds Force commander, Qasem Soleimani. Under Soleimani's command, the Quds Force has been responsible for supporting terror, fomenting violence, advancing Iran's goals of regional dominance, and the killing of American service members in Iraq and Afghanistan. By lifting the sanctions on these entities and on Suleiman himself, the Obama-Iran deal aids the efforts of America's enemies. Imagine for a moment a world in which this deal has been implemented. Iranian-backed forces in Yemen will receive additional aid and support as they work to ensure the Yemen, that Yemen remains a failed state a theater in which al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has effectively operated, and a threat to Saudi Arabia's heavily Shia eastern province. <coughs> Iraq will see an influx of weapons and resources for Iran's proxies, leading to increased violence and bloodshed as the Sunni-Shiite conflict deepens and ISIS is able to recruit more Sunni to their cause. Conflict will intensify in Syria as Iran floods its most important Arab foothold with weapons and fighters. The European refugee crisis will likely grow as thousands more flee the rising terror and chaos. Hezbollah, Iran's main proxy, will also benefit in its operations across the Middle East, and particularly in its ongoing attacks on Israel. In the meantime, the removal of restrictions on the IRGC Quds Force will give that group the ability to move freely throughout the Middle East as they oversee this brave new world. It isn't just Hezbollah and the Houthis and Bashar Assad who will benefit from the lifting of restrictions on Iran. Iran's ties to terrorist groups are extensive. That's why Republican and Democratic administrations alike have identified them as the world's leading state sponsor of terror. In 2011, President Obama's own Treasury Department designated six al-Qaeda terrorists for their involvement in a network that moves money and terrorists across the Middle East, including into Iraq and Afghanistan. That network was headquartered in Iran. In the words of David Cohen, then Under Secretary of the Treasury, and today Deputy Director of the CIA, quote, there is an agreement between the Iranian government and Al-Qaeda to allow this network to operate. There is no dispute in the intelligence community on this point. Former Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, General Michael Flynn, has said the documents captured with Osama bin Laden included, quote, letters about Iran's role influence and acknowledgement of enabling al-Qaeda operatives to pass through Iran as long as al-Qaeda did its dirty work against Americans in Iraq and Afghanistan. Since that initial designation, President Obama's own Treasury and State Departments have repeatedly pointed to Iran's agreement with al-Qaeda, noting that Iran is, quote, a critical transit point for funding to support al-Qaeda's activities in Afghanistan and Pakistan and home to a, quote, core pipeline through which al-Qaeda moves money, 
facilitators and operatives from across the Middle East to South Asia. This pipeline exists, according to the Obama Treasury Department, as part of a formerly secret deal between Iran and Al Qaeda. As recently as last year, while the nuclear talks were underway, Treasury said that Iran had let Yassin al Suri, identified as the leader of the network in July 2011, let him out of his temporary detention so he could resume control of the network. The president has said he understands that Iran's support for terror continues. He has said that should not stop Congress from approving his nuclear deal. He seems willfully blind to the fact that the benefits conveyed to Iran in this agreement, the money, the conventional weapons, the sanctions relief, facilitate and enable the Iranian regime's support for terror and terrorist groups, including those who have attacked the United States and are today threatening our security, our allies, and our interests. The United States Congress stood ready to approve a strong, serious agreement to prevent the threat of a nuclear-armed Iran. Instead, it has been handed as intricately, uh, an intricately crafted capitulation. And though President Obama has spoken of this deal as part of his legacy, the consequences are on me, as he put it. Even that is beside the point. What happens after the deal is not on him. It is on all of us. This deal gives Tehran the means to launch a nuclear attack on the U.S. homeland. It threatens the security of our Arab allies across the Middle East. It threatens the security of Europe. And it should not be forgotten. This deal has vast implications for the future security of the Jewish people. <coughs> Charles Krauthammer has written that it took Nazi Germany seven years to kill six million Jews. It would take a nuclear-armed Iran one day. Every American president for over half a century has been committed to nuclear nonproliferation in the Middle East, every one of them, until now. With this agreement, the current administration is saying to Iran, in effect, you can enrich uranium, you can have ICBMs, and by the way, you can also get back full swing in the arms trade. Oh yes, and here's $150 billion, which we implore you, please not share it with your terrorist friends. To build a deliverable nuclear weapon is a mercifully difficult enterprise. But when the world wakes up one day to find the news that Islamic radicals in Tehran have done it, all the pretenses will fall away and new lines of force come into view with all further terms to be worked out under the threat of the first use of a nuclear weapon since Nagasaki. When a former ranking Democrat on Senate Foreign Relations says that he fears that Iran will gain such a weapon and that he doesn't want his name on it, his colleagues should pay very close attention. That man is dealing with reality. The best assurance against these things coming to pass is a decisive bipartisan majority in Congress that will vote against this deal and gather still more strength to override a veto. Some have suggested the White House recognizes the difficulty members of the president's own party are facing as they are pressured to cast a vote in opposition to the interests and views of their own constituents, not to, me not to mention the nation. <clears throat> to avoid this, a filibuster has been discussed. That way, no member need be on the record supporting this shameful deal. Anyone unwilling to stand up and be counted on this deal should not be serving an elective office. The truth of the matter is that such momentous issues of national security should not be decided by a filibuster, a veto, or by one-third of the members of the United States Senate, least of all by a president who justifies his actions with a false choice, this deal or war. Now, as at other fateful turns in our history, the alternative to nightmarish scenarios that we all wish to avoid is not to make concession after concession after concession. The moment President Obama conceded that the Iranian regime had any right to enrich uranium, he lost the possibility of securing a good deal. The moment he let up on sanctions, which were constricting the regime's power and influence, would only have gotten worse for them. Pressure was lifted from the mullahs in Tehran, and they no longer needed a deal more than we did. 
And as soon as President Obama went on Israeli TV and effectively ruled out the option of force, the Iranians knew they had won. A far better deal is still possible, and it begins with reasserting our original objective on each of these matters. Iran must halt its enrichment and reprocessing activities. It must halt its ballistic missile activities. It must provide a full and complete accounting of all its past nuclear activities. It must allow complete go-anywhere-anytime access, including at military sites. There should be no sanctions relief until Iran has fulfilled these obligations. If Iran chooses not to do so, they must understand that the United States stands ready to take military action to ensure they do not acquire a nuclear weapon. <laughs> Preventing the proliferation of nuclear weapons is one of the most difficult geostrategic challenges we face, but there are lessons from the past on which we can draw. For decades, rogue regimes and terrorist groups have been attempting to acquire nuclear technology and weapons. <clears throat> In, in 1981, the Israelis launched an air attack against the Iraqi nuclear facility at Osirik, setting back Saddam Hussein's <laughs> nuclear program. By 1991, he had reconstituted large portions of it, which the United States destroyed with our military action in Desert Storm. In 2003, when we liberated Iraq, Libya uh, leader Muammar Gaddafi contacted us days after U.S. forces captured Saddam Hussein. He told us he wanted to turn over his nuclear program. He had watched the fate we delivered to Saddam, and he didn't want to be next. Gaddafi's nuclear materials are now in the United States. Gaddafi's decision had two long-lasting and important effects. First, because he turned over his materials, they did not fall into the hands of militant Islamist terrorists who today control territory inside Libya. Second, his cooperation enabled us to unravel the black market nuclear proliferation network of Pakistani scientist A.Q. Khan, who had sold nuclear equipment and technology to rogue regimes around the globe. We put Khan and his network out of business. There is also evidence that the Iranians halted a portion of their program in 2003 in the aftermath of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, hoping to protect themselves from suffering Saddam's fate. In 2007, we learned that the North Koreans were building a nuclear reactor in Syria's eastern desert, territory now governed by ISIS. When the Israelis brought this information to us, President Bush told them he would not take military action. The Israelis decided to take action on their own and destroyed the reactor. In each of these cases, it was either military action or the credible threat of military action that persuaded these rogue regimes to abandon their weapons programs. Iran will not be convinced to abandon its program peacefully unless it knows it will face military action if it refuses to do so. That's how a serious negotiation plays out. That's how a self-respecting power with everything in the balance asserts its vital interest. Insisting on key non-negotiable points and maintaining a credible threat of military force are the indispensable elements of serious diplomacy over the Iranian nuclear program. That is what the administration should have done all along. Instead, they have presented us with a deal that strengthens our adversaries, threatens our allies, puts our own security at risk. They have placed on the table for congressional review a deal that provides weapons and funds to a regime that has pledged to destroy Israel and maintains death to America as a central pillar of its policies. Arming and funding Iran while simultaneously providing them a pathway to a nuclear arsenal is not an act of peace. It's not, as President Obama claims, the only alternative to war. It is madness. The vote on the Iran deal on the nuclear agreement is ahead and the stakes are very high. Every member of Congress swears to defend the Constitution from enemies outside our shores. I took that oath 10 times, and every time I put my hand on the Bible, I understood that we were also pledging to defend this great and good nation. A vote to reject this agreement will do that. We'll
A vote to reject this agreement will do that. Approving it will not. Thank you very much. I think we're going to take a couple questions, Mark. Absolutely. And uh, can anyone hear me? Yes. Uh, the Vice President has to leave, uh, but he's agreed to take a few questions. Uh, some of you have sent them up. Uh, the first question is from General David Deptula. Uh, Mr. Vice President, do you believe the administration's timid approach toward the Assad regime over the past several years is a reflection of the degree they were willing to assuage Iran to secure their nuclear agreement? And has that approach spilled over to the current anemic effort against the Islamic State, which is averaging 18 airstrikes a day compared to Desert Storm's average of 1,200 a day? Uh, I think, and this is speculation on my part, but I do believe that um, uh, the administration's concern with respect to getting the nuclear deal led directly to the president's decision to stand down after he'd established the red line, said that if uh, Syria... Uh, used chemical weapons, he would take military action. And of course, they used chemical weapons and he didn't. And um, I'm, my own personal view is he was in that uh, phase of the process where he did not want to offend the Iranians who are closely tied to the Syrians. Uh, so I think it had a, a uh, the deal had a direct result of uh, limiting um, the administration's actions with respect to the Syrian case. Uh, this question has come from the Iraqi ambassador to the United States, Luke Manfaili. Um, we sometimes hear some people say that in retrospect, the containment of Saddam Hussein would have been better than U.S. policy of toppling him. What do you think about those who now talk about the containment of ISIL? Well, I, uh, first of all, I disagree with the first proposition. I think uh, to argue that uh, we should not have gone after Saddam Hussein would be to argue that he'd still be in, in place today, he'd still be in power today. Uh, we never would have issued or, or delivered the the warning uh, in terms of our military action against Saddam, uh, against uh, Libya, Muammar Gaddafi. You can imagine what would have happened if uh, when ISIS took over or the radicals took over in, in uh, Libya if they'd inherited a nuclear program. So I, I don't buy into the, uh, the initial proposition. And I can't remember what your question was. And then uh, the people who say we can contain ISIS. Oh, we can contain ISIS. I don't, uh, I don't see any way to contain ISIS. It seems to me that they are working very aggressively uh, to recruit and grow in size, including recruiting people out of the United States here. I uh, think they've already made remarkable progress for a terrorist organization, uh, more success uh, occupying and creating the caliphate and uh, occupying uh, thousands of square miles of Syria and Iraq. They have continued to spread their influence and their activities. We've seen them in, um, uh, in Libya and North Africa. Uh, Boko Haram and uh, Nigeria has agreed now to align itself with ISIS. And I just I think their prospect for growth and development is, um, is remarkable. And uh, I don't think, I'm not sure how you would can contain them. I think ultimately they have to be defeated, they have to be destroyed. Uh, supposedly that's the objective the president's laid out, but his, uh, his military activity so far um, I think falls short of what's necessary. Uh, this question is from Linda Sachs. The corker Cardin bill surrendered the treaty power of the Senate to the president, who went to the UN outside the powers of the president. What do you think will get us back to the American exceptionalism of the Constitution? Well, I. Uh, as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, I think this should have been treated as a treaty, that it's that important, uh, rather than the way it is being treated. And of course, if, you'd, if we'd handled it as a treaty, then it would take a two-thirds vote of the Senate to ratify it, which is the tr traditional way of doing business. Now, we've done a lot of executive agreements over the years, but this one is so important with such enormous ramifications um, that um, uh, the failure to follow that regular procedure strikes me as a, was a mistake. Uh, it was a negotiated arrangement, I guess, but as we look at it now, um, you don't need a two-thirds vote of the uh, Senate uh, to uh, ratify it. Uh, they only need one-third, uh, one-third plus one. So I think, it, uh, I think it was a serious procedural mistake. 
And one last question, and I ask everybody if you could please remain seated while the Vice President exits as he has to get to a plane, not to go to the West Coast. Uh, the last question is from Senator Tom Cotton. Uh, the President has said that he will confront Iran's regional aggression after this deal is implemented. What steps should this confrontation include to stop Iran's aggression and reassure Israel and our Sunni partners? I believe it when I see it. Uh, I, am, I have serious reservations after you pour um, over $100 billion back into Iran, you lift sanctions and, and embargoes on things like uh, conventional weapons and um, ICBMs. Uh, you uh, take off the uh, embargoes on doing business, for example, with uh, the IRGC, with the Quds Force. I think you've given them an, an enormous shot in the arm in terms of their uh, ability to pursue their terrorist activities and their support for um, uh, illicit regimes. And um, then you're going to turn around and mount military operations somehow to take them down. I'm, uh, it doesn't fit. It doesn't calculate in my mind. I think if the, um, um, if, if, if the problems we have with the nuclear agreement in and of itself weren't enough, when you add to that the last-minute addition of lifting uh, the sanctions and the uh, um, embargoes on ballistic missiles, on conventional weapons, um, then uh, uh, that in and of itself uh, does enormous damage. So I'm afraid that the idea that somehow we can contain Iran afterwards uh, is going to take a, an awful uh, lot of effort, major effort. We may have no choice but to do that. But as I mentioned in here, the state of the Defense Department's budget these days is, is um, significantly depressed. Uh, Ray Odierno, who just stepped down as the uh, Army Chief of Staff, said the readiness level in the United States Army today is the lowest it's ever been in the history of the Army. That's over 200 years. Um, so we've got a situation where uh, we badly need to rebuild our military capability, uh, especially if we're going to be in the business of trying to uh, contain the damage that Iran is going to do with all of the relief that we've given them in terms of funds, in terms of lifting sanctions, in terms of, of um, reversing course on limiting their ICBM force and so forth. So I, uh, if, if you look down the road and think about where we're going to be once this is implemented and once we see uh, the uh, Iranians exercise their part of it, um, given especially the continued Iranian assertion that they're, we're never going to see their military sites. Um, the uh, Secretary of Defense equivalent in Iran just in the last day or two held a press conference, I guess this week, in which he said uh, the United States will always be the great Satan for us. We'll continue to do everything we can to support uh, their uh, opponents and to support those people who are hostile to Israel. Um, this doesn't mean any withdrawal or change in behavior on the part of, of Iran. That's the statement of their defense minister. If, uh, if it's the president, this president is unlikely to do any of these things, what, what would your advice be if there's a Republican president that succeeds him in, uh, in 500 or so days? Well, first of all, I hope it happens. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I also... Um, I, uh, I think the, the most significant thing we have to do before we do anything else, <coughs> excuse me, is um, rebuild our military. You've had every single member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and testimony before the Congress over the last year or so testify that we no longer have the capacity or we're nearly to the point where we no longer have the capacity to execute the nation's uh, national security strategy. The Air Force, uh, Air Force Chief of Staff recently said that the Air Force today has fewer aircraft and older aircraft than any time in uh, the history of the Air Force, which was created right after World War II in 1947 and 48. You can just go down chapter and verse. We've got to rebuild that capacity. Cyber warfare is a, a major play. We've had a, a technological edge in virtually every area that was significant militarily since the end of World War II, whether it was stealth or precision-guided munitions, et cetera. We're to the point now where that gap is rapidly closing. We've got the Chinese and the Russians are actively and aggressively um, working hard to close that gap. And you see what's happened with respect to the whole area of cyber warfare here at home. The same time the Congress was debating 
and adopting a measure to, in effect, take all of the uh, data that we collected in the NSA program uh, and turn it back to the companies without any limits or restrictions on what they're to do with it. Uh, that same week that that debate was going forward in the Congress and being passed, it was disclosed the Chinese had hacked into our uh, personnel database here. And all of us who ever worked for the federal government, and I don't mean to take this personally, um, <laughs> all of us, including a lot of the members of the Congress, uh, their security background checks and so forth, their, their personnel records are in the hands of the Chinese. The Chinese were ripping us off as we were wringing our hands and saying, oh my gosh, we can't have the NSA collecting fact of call data uh, on American citizens. And nobody, to my knowledge, has yet produced one single instance where a, the civil liberties of an American citizen have been violated by that program. Not one. But we spent an enormous amount of time, in the end, shifted all the data back to the phone companies and uh, significantly weakened our capacity to use that um, capability to uh, intercept and uh, block uh, actions by Al Qaeda, ISIS, our, uh, our enemies. Mr. Vice President, thank you very much for joining us here today. Well, thank you all, and thank you, AEI. If everyone can, if everyone can remain seated, please. Remain seated while the Vice President exits. Thank you. If you missed any of the comments or the discussion with former Vice President Dick Cheney, you can find them online. Just go to our video library. I'm the leading state sponsor of terrorism.